a graphic guide to frame construction put out by Taunton Press. Um, I got it through Fine Home Building and the Taunton Press. Hugely helpful uh, for understanding walls. They actually have a really good drawing that they break this stuff down. Oh, you think my drawing is not really good? Wait till you see my drawing. Um, in And they break down different ways than you would do it and why you would do it differently. Also, I've used it a lot, so parts of it come out. <laughs> we, fortunately, Taunton builds better walls than they do bindings. Construction calculators are also an incredibly handy tool if, like me, you don't like working in fractions all the time. And one of my big luxuries is a chop saw. Chop saws can be expensive, but for cutting angles with precision, there's nothing quite like them. And a note on buying cordless tools, buy in the same brand because the batteries will be interchangeable and that's the expensive part of your tool kit. What materials you're gonna use and why gets incredibly complicated and is somewhat subject to your regional availability. So having a good relationship with someone at your hardware store or your local lumber store to actually ask their opinion is gonna be invaluable for your project. But in this video, we're gonna go over some of the basics of materials. So you can sound more informed and more educated when you go to ask specific questions for your project. Also, it will really help in the design and the layout of your project. And I want to mention here to remember that these materials come from places like this. So trying our best not to be wasteful with material and to use, reuse, salvage, and be efficient with what we can and energy efficient is hugely important. The skeleton for most of the projects I'm gonna talk about is gonna be two by lumber. It's what most of the walls are built out of and what most pieces that we use. However, there's a lot of things you need to know when you're talking about framing lumber, such as a two by four or a two by six, is in fact not two inches by four inches or two inches by six inches. Unless you're using very old lumber that will actually be true width two inches by four inches, but you're talking like I'm taking apart my you know 18th century barn or my 1920s house. For the rest of us, when we go to order lumber, we need to be aware that a two by four is one and a half inches thick by three and a half inches wide and a two by six is one and a half inches thick by five and a half inches wide. So when you're making your calculations for your wall, the difference between a assuming it's a six inch and then knowing it's a five and a half inch is huge. Wall studs also come in different heights. A standard height stud is 92 and 5 eighths, and we'll get into that later when we talk about wall framing. But then you can also buy it in eight foot heights, 10 foot heights, 12 foot, 14, 16, and depending on what's available in your lumber store, so on and so forth. There are also different grades of lumber. So if you need something that's really straight or really precise, you'll wanna to talk to your lumber store about getting a different grade of lumber. And also the sustainability and where it's harvested, you can look at that for your lumber. And if you're using lumber like I have here in this video, where I have lumber that's actually directly touching the concrete foundation, I actually need to put treated lumber there. So this is my bottom board that I'm about to stack this on. That is a pressure treated piece of lumber that can withstand the moisture that's gonna wick up from the concrete. That's a very, very important distinction, treated lumber versus non-treated lumber. One of the reasons to use different size lumber is to accommodate different size insulation. So if you're in somewhere cold, or if you're building some sort of structure where you wanna keep everything warmer, you're gonna use a thicker material. And nowhere is this more important than your roof, where most of the heat rises and is likely to escape. So for instance, in the case of this greenhouse where I'm using leftover materials from various projects and I'm not as concerned about keeping it warm, uh, I am only using two by sixes, which means the max R value I'm probably gonna get in this ceiling is R21. There will be times when the plants don't like this, but this was also a project that was a balance of budget and supplies. On the other hand, in our house, we used eye joists for our ceiling so we could have a foam blueboard air channel and much thicker insulation. In other building projects, you use wood trusses like these scissor trusses, which allow even more insulation to be added, but still have a breathing air channel. And for the studio, when we found these super cool old aircraft hanger trusses, we decided we wanted to use those, which significantly complicated our roof assembly and meant that we were gonna have to build everything sort of upside down of what we had planned. 
But that's the thing about when you salvage materials. You have to be willing to change your plans to adapt to the salvaged materials rather than what you might have done if you built from scratch. So we added these two by eights on top of a plywood ceiling on top of our curved trusses, and then we insulated between them. It meant we only got R19 insulation in our roof, which is way less than we would have wanted, but that's R19 is what's available in our area commonly and is the best insulation with a breathing channel we could accommodate to use those curved trusses. So for wall sheathing and roof decking, let's real quick talk about the sizes that your wall sheathing and roof decking usually comes in. Whether you're using this OSB that we're putting up here, oriented strand board, plywood, or that green zip sheathing we'll talk about in a little bit, it generally comes in sizes of four foot by eight foot sheets or four foot by 10 foot sheets, which means your layout and to be efficient with your materials, you're gonna to wanna to have your wall studs and your roofing members on either 16 inch centers or 24 inch centers, depending on the loads and the way you're building your structure. But this is gonna make you very efficient with your materials. One of the reasons to use OSB oriented strand board is it's wood chips held together by glue. It's really quite affordable. It's relatively fast and easy to use and is commonly available. There are some more waterproof versions of this material with either a waxy coating or something very specific like Advantech flooring, which is a super durable version of OSB. But most OSB really needs to be protected pretty quickly, which means you need to get a house wrap on it. And house wrap is kind of a pain to put up. It's a very efficient and uh, relatively cheap material, but it does not like wind. So if you're gonna have to have house wrap on your building for a long period of time, it's gonna be difficult to keep it on and not have anything go wrong with it. The zip sheathing that we used on our house, which is a very, it's a OSB board with the, basically with the house wrap built in, that's the green coating. Which is why for our house, when we built, we knew we were fighting weather windows, we used zip sheathing which you can tape and weather secure very, very quickly. You'll notice on our house, there was green and brown zip sheathing. That's the different thicknesses of the zip sheathing. For walls, it's sufficient to use half inch. For our roofing and for our snow loads, we needed 5 8 inch zip sheathing, and that ended up being a brown color. It also meant that we could have our house be very weather secure for a long period of time without worrying about high winds. We did it on the studio floor because we were flipping it over and we'll never see it again. So we wanted this to be waterproof and very secure. On the curved part of our house, we used quarter inch CDX, which is construction grade plywood, um, so that it would be more weather resistant and make the curve. We also did this on the ceiling of the studio. We just happened to get really, really lucky and get an absolutely beautiful load of construction grade CDX plywood. If not, we might have spent the extra money and bought veneered plywood or taken some drywall mud or paint and painted the ceiling. We just happened to get a beautiful load, made the curve that we wanted, and created a look that we really enjoyed. A quick note on the most expensive part of your project, probably, is going to be your windows. And this is one place where you can save a lot of money if you hunt for used windows or windows that people bought that didn't actually fit their project or they didn't end up installing. For our house project, we did buy brand new windows because I had very specifically designed the bow and wanted to try In it. In the studio, we went to a window company and asked for their seconds or their display models or anything that was returned. And we got some really, really beautiful windows for a significant, and doors, for a significant fraction of the cost. However, that meant we had to somewhat design around the windows and the doors that we had rather than buying the windows and the doors to fit what we expected we were gonna build. And we had to be very specific with which windows went where. We could have a beautiful wood framed window on this east where it's very protected and not gonna get damaged. But in the bathroom where we're gonna get water splash and condensation, we needed to make sure we had a fully vinyl window and no wood components to be damaged. So a note on salvage materials. I love using salvage materials but they are labor and time and energy intensive, and they will frustrate, twist, split, and you have to collect a lot more than you think to do your project. So while they're entirely worth it, 
and they're definitely going to add character and distinction to your building that you wouldn't otherwise have. Pay very, very close attention to what you're collecting, how much you're collecting, and your plan for it, because you may also have to reinforce and modify them to make sure they're structurally sound and also that they're safe. They don't have lead paint that you're gonna be sanding. They don't have anything they're gonna be shedding into your building. Um, those sorts of considerations when you're using something that has been used before and might have materials on it you may wanna be aware of. Next episode, guess what? We get to get building finally, because it's time to get into the thing that holds the whole building up. Let's talk foundations.